thank you very much. It's a it's a pleasure to be able to uh, uh, perform this webcast and to uh, discuss topics related to nuclear energy. It's a very dynamic field. Uh, let me just briefly introduce myself. I'm a professor, and I, I do chair the Department of Nuclear Engineering at, at UC Berkeley, and I've worked on topics related to nuclear energy, reactor safety, waste management uh, over uh, about the last 20 years or so. So I'm going to be hitting on some uh, interesting uh, material, I think, uh, that's not commonly known. As I mentioned, this is a very dynamic field these days. I will not be covering all of the topics that people are likely to be interested in, and so I'm going to try to leave sufficient amount of time so that, that we can also run through a number of questions. And with that, uh, let me just go ahead and dive in uh, to the, the presentation uh, with uh, some uh, important history. Uh, what I have here is a bit of history. Uh, this is the discovery of fission. Uh, Lisa Meitner, Otto Hahn, 1938. Uh, had been doing experiments trying to make heavy elements, and they had been uh, irradiating uranium with neutrons. And the chemistry of these heavy elements they thought they were making was very strange uh, until Lisa suggested that perhaps what was happening instead was a fission reaction, which would explain, because then you would be making many different uh, elements uh, all across the periodic table, which would have a wide variety of different chemical characteristics, and that, that explanation, of course, had tremendous implications uh, because it meant that you could um, uh, generate enormous amounts of energy uh, through this type of reaction. Within about three months or so, it had been confirmed that the reaction also released additional neutrons, which made the possibility of a chain reaction possible. Uh, within uh, a short period of time after that, the two physicists, Leo Schlazard and uh, Edward Teller visited Albert Einstein in Princeton uh, and described what was going on to him. He wrote a famous letter to President Roosevelt, uh, and that launched the Manhattan Project and pretty much uh, the whole second half of the 20th century. And so uh, the, the potential to use fission as a source of peaceful energy was recognized very early on, and considerable development occurred. So when we look at the use of, of nuclear fission for energy production, uh, what we do is we react uh, heavy elements like uranium-235 with neutrons. Uh, this reaction, uh, sometimes the uranium-235 will absorb the neutron, but about 60% of the time it will undergo a fission reaction, releasing additional neutrons and about 200 million electron volts of energy. Uh, those additional neutrons go on to be absorbed elsewhere, uh, at least one has to go on to sustain the chain reaction, and then the other will be absorbed to, to generate what we call activation products. Now, the amount of energy released by this sort of reaction is quite large. And so uh, if you see, uh, the energy density given here is about 8.2 times 10 to the 13th joules per kilogram. That's a really large number put, put into uh, more easily understood terms. If you had a 1,000 megawatt electric power plant, uh, it would consume, or they do consume, on the order of about seven pounds of uranium per day as fuel, uh, which is a, a remarkably small amount since the amount of electricity being generated is sufficient for about a million homes. The waste products that are generated include fission products uh, from this reaction, uh, which uh, uh, are a wide variety of different elements. The majority of fission products decay uh, to stable isotopes quite rapidly. Uh, some take a bit longer, uh, say strontium-90, about 30 years, cesium-137, about 30 years. Within, it's interesting, but within about um, 300 years, the radioactivity of fission products is actually lower than the original radioactivity of the uranium that was mined. Uh, and this means that if, if the only waste product were the fission products, uh, the waste would really not be a major issue. But the other type of material that is generated in the reactors involves the uh, capture of neutrons into heavy elements, creating what are called transuranics, plutonium, neptunium, americium. These are the things that have longer lives and constitute the bulk of the long-term waste problem. They also turn out to be elements that can be recycled if reactors are designed appropriately uh, and fissioned, and therefore 
uh, do not are not an intrinsic element of the waste stream, although currently uh, the plans are that we would dispose of spent fuel containing these materials. The other radioactive materials that are uh, generated uh, structures uh, in activation of coolants uh, decay rather rapidly and don't constitute a long-term problem. Now, the other uh, issue that we need to think about in considering different energy sources uh, is the life cycle impact, and in particular for, for non-fossil sources, it's the construction of the infrastructure that we need to think about because that's important. And so I've listed construction materials here, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment since there's a number of implications in looking at the quantities of material needed to uh, build different types of energy infrastructure. But before we do that, let's go ahead and contrast uh, nuclear with fossil fuels. And so here you have chemical reactions illustrated uh, where we are reacting uh, air with coal, and uh, these reactions generate uh, dominantly carbon dioxide and water vapor, and uh, in this case about 160 electron volts for the reaction which is pictured. This uh, uh, releases energy, you see, 2.9 times 10 to the 7 joules per kilogram. Uh, that's, uh, uh, in, uh, in macroscopic terms, uh, the same 1,000 megawatt electric power plant is going to consume about 15 million pounds of fuel per day. Uh, and because it's not practical for us to uh, isolate the waste from doing that, uh, we'll discharge those wastes directly into the environment. And that includes things like nitric oxides and sulfur oxides, which contribute, which generate um, acid rain, uh, large volumes of ash, uh, which needs to be disposed of, and, of course, very large quantities of carbon uh, dioxide as well. Uh, the mining process uh, is also involves uh, very large quantities of material, and we need to be thinking about the amounts of material used to construct the infrastructure. Now, at this point, we're actually up about, uh, up approaching about 7 billion tons of coal consumed per year. This is a really large amount. It's difficult to picture, uh, but one way of thinking about it is that in the United States, where we're up at about 1.2 billion tons per year, 70% uh, of all of the rail traffic in the United States is coal. Uh, it's a massive enterprise. Now, there's some possibility that we could consider sequestering the carbon dioxide, uh, which would require uh, at about 5 billion tons, sequestering about 18 billion tons per year. But that could be very challenging. And so a major question is, where is it that we might uh, get um, uh, uh, an alternative for baseload electricity generation and process heat. So let me go ahead and move forward uh, here and begin to look at uh, some of the uh, information related to nuclear energy that uh, uh, starts to address this question. One of the first points that's important to make is that over the last 20 years, there has actually been a uh, transformation in the capability of utilities to operate plants reliably. If you went back to the mid-80s, which was the last time I think uh, uh, the public was really seriously looking at nuclear energy, the situation was pretty dismal. Uh, average capacity factor you can see was below 60 percent, which means that over a third of reactors on average across the United States uh, would be shut down any given day of the week. and uh, over the, the couple of decades when we weren't really paying that much attention to nuclear energy, we certainly weren't building new plants, uh, much better processes for running the plants were developed, uh, which resulted in this very large increase in the average capacity factor. And in fact, today it's above 90 percent. Uh, of that, less than 2 percent is for forced outages, and the remainder is for rather rapid refueling outages. So uh, this the capability to operate the plants reliably is something that's new, and it makes the electricity generated by existing plants very affordable. Now, if you went back to the early 80s, the other big question uh, uh, and the other big problem was the fact that it was also very difficult to build new plants on schedule and on budget. Uh, long, uh, uh, large cost overruns uh, and long schedule delays were routine back then. 
The big question that we face today is whether or not we can do a better job of building new plants and then also see them evolve in terms of the technology of fuels, uh, capability to recycle material, capability to utilize thorium and uranium. Uh, and I'll try to touch on that uh, as we move forward here. So to put things into context, and again, uh, please ignore all of the exclamation marks. Uh, it's not that exciting. But uh, uh, we're, we're in a world where we use massive quantities of fossil fuels. Uh, and we need to stop doing that. Uh, by 2050, it would be very desirable for us to have a large reduction in the amounts that we consume. Now, uh, the production cost for nuclear electricity actually today is very low, uh, and this is due in large part to the fact that uranium is a very inexpensive fuel, and the plants are operating very reliably. Because of this, uh, there have been actions taken to extend licenses for our existing plants. And at this point, uh, we anticipate that within about the next five to 10 years, almost 100% of our existing plants will receive license extensions for another 20 years of operation. Uh, we've also had substantial activity uh, in terms of announcements to develop and build new reactors including a large number of combined construction operating license applications which have gone into the US NRC. Now, if we take a look at how nuclear compares to other energy sources, of course, one of the things that we're interested in is in the carbon dioxide emissions. This figure shows emissions from various different sources. And you can see that the renewables in nuclear are pretty small. Uh, coal and gas are quite large. Now, it's possible to debate, you know, is nuclear more or less than wind and so on and so forth. That's really not the important question. Uh, the important question is instead, to what extent can we replace coal and gas uh, by lower emitting sources like nuclear, wind, solar, and hydro? And when it comes to coal, it's important to, to remember that the dominant use of coal uh, in the world is to generate baseload electrical power. Uh, and nuclear in this list is the only one that is also capable of doing that directly without the need for any storage. So we also, I think it's important to emphasize the question of life cycle impacts uh, of energy production on workers and on public health. Certainly the use of coal, uh, the, the impact of coal goes well beyond uh, the environmental emissions uh, and into the, the worker safety issues. Uh, we have, on average, uh, currently almost 100 fatalities in the US per year associated with coal mining and transport. In China, the number is closer to 5,000. And uh, this, is, this is just one of the costs that comes from relying on uh, a, a large amount of fuel. Uh, these are actually statistics for the U.S. for coal mining. You can see that, that we're sitting at an average of about uh, 100 worker fatalities per year within this industry in the United States. Uh, if we look at safety, um, the, the interesting thing about nuclear energy is that its safety record is, is uh, quite good, not, not just in terms of, of minimizing the number of accidents, uh, since actually no, no significant accidents, uh, since uh, Three Mile Island, except for Chernobyl, involving a much different reactor design in Russia. But we can also look at the question of worker safety. The, the nuclear numbers that you see here have actually been multiplied by a factor of 10, uh, because otherwise they're so low that they almost fall on top of zero. And in fact, they, working in a nuclear plant, in terms of, of the injuries that are monitored by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, uh, the safety of working in nuclear power plants today is about four times greater than the safety of working in offices, uh, which is the financial insurance and, and real estate market. It's actually, you have to worry about file cabinets falling over, repetitive stress injuries, things of that nature. So let's go ahead and also look at just healthy, you know, the, the, the effects of, of working in, you know, in jobs that involve, in some, in some cases, uh, some contact with radiation. We've had uh, large studies of worker uh, health, uh, most recently by the uh, Columbia School of Public Health, 
which surveyed and, and monitored 54,000 nuclear power plant employees, they were not able to detect any statistical correlation between radiation exposure and health. What you will see, though, is that compared to general population, uh, people who work in nuclear power plants actually uh, are extraordinarily healthy. The fatality rate or mortality rates for nuclear power plant workers uh, are 35% lower for cancer, 66% lower for all other causes, uh, which uh, gives you a 60% lower mortality rate in general. Now, this, is, this effect actually is observed in other industries, although not quite as strongly. Uh, one way that you could look at these statistics would be to say that you know, anybody who can get a job in a nuclear power plant can reduce their chance of dying by a factor of two and a half. Uh, that's not really the, the correct way to look at it. Certainly, it has nothing to do with the fact that some jobs in nuclear plants involve exposure to radiation uh, because there's no statistical correlation there. A lot of it really is associated with the fact that uh, nuclear power plant jobs pay very well. Uh, the workforce tends to be educated, and you have a very strong safety culture, which means that your people are much more likely to um, uh, want to to uh, buckle their seatbelts uh, on you know when they're driving home and things of that nature. So let's go ahead and move forward and, and take a look now at uh, both economics and life cycle assessment for nuclear energy infrastructure. Uh, the first question relates to fuel, and it's important to note that there's a lot of uranium around uh, the world. And this is a map of uranium concentrations in soils in the United States uh, that was generated uh, back in the 1970s and 80s. And it, you can see that the uh, uh, concentrations vary from place to place. Uh, I sit in Berkeley, and the concentration of uranium in our soils here is uh, 1.8 parts per million, which turns out to be almost exactly the same as the national average. Uh, I think that you know, in, in Berkeley, this is probably about the only way uh, that we're average uh, here in Berkeley in terms of, of the nation. Every another other way, we tend to do things a bit differently. Uh, at any rate, so this this uh, it, it turns out that, that you know scarcity of uranium is not something that we tend to worry about uh, from the perspective of being able to expand the use of nuclear energy, particularly because the current reactors use uranium very inefficiently, and new reactor designs can uh, be developed that can use it more efficiently, as well as uh, uh, use in the potentially in the, the longer term thorium as a source of fuel as well. So. Let's go ahead and then look at what it takes to construct the plants. Uh, and in nuclear plants, as with other types of energy infrastructure, the most important inputs are steel and concrete. They constitute, for most energy technologies, over 95% of the total inputs. And you can see here that it takes approximately 40 metric tons of steel uh, per megawatt of average capacity uh, and 90 cubic meters of concrete to build a new nuclear plant. Uh, if you look at wind, in the case of wind, it turns out to be about 460 metric tons and 870 cubic meters of concrete, uh, an order of magnitude more. This is not really surprising since uh, you're harvesting a much more dilute energy source. One should also then think about the need for storage uh, for this technology, which is not included in these numbers. If you look at coal, surprisingly, it actually takes about twice as much material to build a coal plant as it takes to build a nuclear plant, and then you burn large amounts of coal. So the idea that you should substitute nuclear for coal, I think, is supported not just from the perspective of the emissions, but also from the life cycle perspective. Uh, and then finally, if we look at natural gas, it takes very little material to build a natural gas power plant. Uh, they're very efficient because they rely on gas Brayton cycle technology, the same technology that you know you can hang on the wing of an airplane, and airplanes will take off. That's certainly not the case with uh, coal plants. Uh, you can't hang a coal plant on the wing of an airplane and get it to go up into the air. So. With this, this sort of, of uh, uh, balance, one can see that, that nuclear plants actually don't take a lot of natural resources to build. And in fact, if we look specifically at all of the commodities needed to build a nuclear power plant, 
Uh, and this table shows the aluminum, brass. Uh, you'll see that, in fact, it is uh, still steel and concrete that are dominant. Copper is the next most important thing that goes into the construction of nuclear plants. And we go back to before the, the, the recession hit when we had very high commodity prices. And we do multiplication. We add it all together. It turns out that the construction of nuclear power plants, the commodity inputs constitute about $36 per kilowatt out of the total price. Uh, and today, the price to build nuclear plants uh, that vendors are charging is in the range of four to $5,000 per kilowatt, which means that the material inputs are actually down in the range of about 1% of the total cost, which is getting down into the range of, say, what the cost of the silicon is in computer chips. This raises the very interesting question of whether or not we can see prices drop substantially uh, since uh, much of the, the, the cost that you're seeing here uh, is value added. And more efficient manufacturing processes have the potential to bring these construction prices down to be closer to the actual commodity input cost. And the potential for doing that exists. There's already been major changes in the way that we design nuclear plants. Uh, back in the 70s, uh, a typical plant uh, was designed literally using paper and pencils, uh, antiquated computers, uh, and slide rules. And because of the complexity of all the piping, given active safety systems, there you'd actually have people building plastic models of the plant to guide the construction process. Uh, today, it's completely different. We have computer-aided design. It goes beyond having just a full three-dimensional model of the plant. Uh, to keeping databases on all of the components uh, and actually being able to model the, the uh, construction process itself, that is, the placement of the major pieces of equipment. There's also a move underway to shift towards a much greater degree of modularization in construction uh, and the use of, of uh, factory prefabrication. And this, this draws on technology that was developed, actually, in the shipbuilding industry, where today ships are almost completely factory prefabricated and are literally assembled like Lego blocks uh, uh, in a dry dock. And a massive billion-dollar cruise ship in Finland today is constructed in under a year. Uh, the Use of modular construction technology also has been developed to some extent back in the 90s. Here you see on the right a large uh, module of a containment building being set in place in Japan uh, in the construction of an advanced boiling water reactor. The next step, though, which is interesting, is the application of factory prefabrication so that all of the structural steel can arrive at the site as modules uh, that uh, arrive on uh, flatbeds of, of rail cars and are actually just literally assembled together, welded together. Mechanical equipment arrives skid-mounted piping modules as well. This is the way that today Westinghouse is building um, uh, reactors in China. And just to point out that these new construction technologies actually have substantially better characteristics uh, in terms of their structural response as well. Uh, here you can see on the left a conventional reinforced concrete wall that has been stressed towards failure. The same wall, but with the steel plate reinforcing is shown on the right. And the big difference is that even as concrete begins to, to break, if it's confined by these steel plates, it still has the capacity to carry the compressive loads. And this means that that these steel plate reinforced structures have excellent ductile response. And in fact, uh, it makes these structures excellent for uh, uh, very severe loading, such as what you have in earthquake, or excuse me, in aircraft crashes. And uh, in fact, all of the new plants that are being constructed today will be constructed to meet uh, aircraft crash requirements. Let me continue. Uh, by showing you what's happening right now in China. The photo on the left is from this July, so just a couple months ago. And what you see is a, a module, a building module, that has been assembled off on the side of the site out of uh, uh, factory prefabricated uh, sections being lifted into place. That's a 700-ton heavy lift. 
being set down, uh, and then the next step is just to pour in concrete in between the plates, and the building is completely constructed. And that's, uh, uh, you know, this is the direction that we expect to see uh, nuclear power plant construction going. And as we uh, continue to increase the amount of factory prefabrication and improve the processes, we should see these construction technologies bringing down construction prices significantly into the future. So the other thing that is much different today from what we did in the past is that today uh, we have a high degree of standardization of plant designs. Uh, and this is a review schedule. The text is a little bit small, but a review schedule that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has issued recently. And what you see here is that the various types of plants that the utilities are going to build are being clustered together. And so up at the top are all of the utilities that are planning to build uh, AP1000 reactors. And the interesting thing is that in these construction projects, uh, the plants will be almost perfectly identical. In general, only about 10% of the design is site-specific, and the remainder is going to be identical. And this much higher degree of standardization is expected to greatly improve the construction schedules and reduce the construction costs. Also, from the regulatory perspective, it means that the NRC can do a thorough review on a lead plant, uh, and then uh, for the remaining plants that need review, they only need to look at the site-specific issues. They don't have to completely review the rest of the application. And this is also anticipated to uh, uh, have a significant effect on the cost of future construction. So the next question is really what will be the long-term trends uh, for uh, nuclear energy technology. And these days, we commonly talk about the generations of technologies, starting with the very early prototypes that were built back in the 50s and 60s. Uh, these were a few tens of megawatt type of, of demonstration reactors. The next we uh, consider are called generation two. These are plants that were uh, actually the ones that are operating today, dominantly constructed in the 1970s and 80s and currently providing about 20% of electricity generation in the United States and about 16% of electricity generation worldwide. In the United States, it's about 70% of the total non-fossil generation, with most of the remainder being uh, large hydro. Today, we're in the process of moving forward with construction of what we call Generation 3 and Generation 3 plus uh, nuclear power plants, with AP1000 being a good example. And the interesting question is, over the next couple of decades, what will emerge in terms of what we call Generation 4, uh, which should be designed to have better economics, uh, uh, further enhancements to safety, to do important things around minimizing waste and using uranium resources and thorium resources efficiently, uh, and to have uh, further improvements in security and in uh, supporting the international nonproliferation regime. So. Uh, AP1000, as I mentioned, is certainly an excellent example of a current Generation 3 plus plant. It features passive safety systems. Uh, it means that you do not need to have external heat sinks or uh, emergency grade power to remove decay heat after the reactor shuts down. Uh, we're also interested in the movement towards uh, more advanced reactor technologies. For example, we have high temperature reactors uh, which are being developed, a pebble bed modular reactor being an example, that have the potential to greatly increase the efficiency with which electricity is generated to make the transition towards closed gas cycles for power conversion, which if you think about the comparison between natural gas and coal-fired power plants, uh, can have a significant impact not just on efficiency but also on construction costs. So down in the lower right is something that we're working on here at UC Berkeley, uh, which we call the Pebble Bed Advanced High Temperature Reactor. And there's a number of different activities underway currently to develop new reactors. I'll just show this one for illustration because uh, it gives you an idea of what uh, may be possible. And indeed, right now we have a lot of interest in the number of startup efforts that are developing uh, new, smaller, modular reactor designs. Uh, in the case of the, the one that we're working on here at UC Berkeley in collaboration with Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, it is a high-temperature reactor. 
uh, its efficiency in converting heat into electricity is about 50% uh, higher than current reactors, has fully passive safety systems, it drives a gas turbine based uh, power conversion system instead of steam turbines, and it also has the capacity to produce hydrogen uh, using high temperature electrolysis. Now, the uh, fuel that you use in this type of reactor is something that's been developed also for helium-cooled reactors. Uh, and these fuels are interesting. They are called coated particle fuels uh, because they're fully ceramic and they can go to extremely high temperatures without any damage or release of radioactive material. And in fact, uh, the, the safety margins in terms of thermal damage to fuel uh, are very large in this type of reactor, several hundred degrees. Uh, they are liquid cooled, so they also operate at high power density. You can see it's a fluoride salt coolant shown on the right that was used in reactor experiments that ran at Oak Ridge back in the 60s and early 1970s. So uh, we've done things in terms of, of experiments to verify, for example, that it's uh, physically possible to circulate pebbles uh, through the reactor using scaled experiments with water. Uh, and in this case, pebbles are actually introduced into the coolant flow that's coming into the bottom of the core, you see uh, in the photo on the left. Uh, and then the pebbles move slowly up through the core and are defueled out of the top. And this is very similar to the way the pebble bed modular reactor works, except everything is inverted, because in the pebble bed modular reactor, the pebbles are taken out from the bottom. And here, since the pebbles float, they're taken out from the top. Um, the interesting thing that happens in switching to liquid cooling instead of using the gas cooling, uh, on the left you have a pebble bed modular reactor pictured, uh, is that the amount of power you can get from a system the same size goes up enormously. And this has implications for economics. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about these high temperature reactor technologies is that they adapt very nicely to using thorium as a fuel uh, uh, source. Okay. So um, other things that you can do with modern technology include seismic base isolation. Uh, we actually have this on the Berkeley campus for one of our old buildings, the uh, Hearst Mining Building. It was invented by our civil engineering department. And basically, you can decouple the entire reactor building from the effects of earthquakes. Uh, the, these uh, uh, high temperature salt cooled reactors are very compact. So what you see in this table on the right-hand column is the volume of the building per megawatt electric of power output. And uh, the design that we've come up with, you'll see, is uh, actually uh, very compact relative to things that have been done previously and therefore uh, may have the potential for uh, improved economics. Now, this is conclusion slide, and I uh, wanted to just say a few words in conclusion and then move to take questions. Uh, but uh, one thing that's important to note, I think, is that uh, right now the field of nuclear energy is uh, quite dynamic. Things are changing rapidly. And uh, one of the reasons for that is that nuclear energy technology requires very, very small amounts of natural resources uh, to implement. And this is not just the fuel side, but also the amounts of resources needed to actually build the infrastructure. Uh, given the very small fraction of construction cost uh, that uh, is actually commodities, goes to pay for commodities, we could see prices for steel, concrete, copper, these other materials increase by a factor of 10 out in the future due to emerging scarcity. And it would not have any substantive impact on the cost of producing electricity in this way. Uh, we will see the construction of the first new nuclear power plant starting up within just a couple of years. Uh, and then we'll also see some significant efforts aimed at uh, demonstrating high efficiency, higher efficiencies in electricity generation and the production of hydrogen uh, and in uh, new designs which can further lower capital costs. And so, with these conclusions, I think probably it is time for me to uh, go ahead and answer questions. Uh, I'm sure that people will be interested in topics related to waste and fuel cycles and security and other things. And so I'll spend the remaining time uh, on answering questions. Thank you. Great. That was, that was fascinating. I certainly learned a lot. And um, 
the questions are already starting to come in. There's one from Don here. Considering the current political climate, what impediment, impediments excuse me, do you see the industry has to overcome to see significant advancements implemented? Well, there's, there's a number of things that, that need to be done. The, the most important constraints today are really related to the uh, uh, manufacturing capacity and uh, the, the, the workforce availability. And so expanding manufacturing capacity, I think, is, is something that's uh, a major priority. The uh, route that Westinghouse has taken uh, with moving most of the construction work, fabrication work, into a factory environment is probably the thing that is going to be most helpful in addressing that issue. The currently um, uh, the module fabrication factory that's running in China uh, has the capacity to produce two AT1000 reactors per year. Uh, it was built in a period of three years. Uh, Westinghouse and Shaw are building right now a similar module construction factory in Lake uh, Charles, Louisiana, that will have a similar capacity. And so expanding the capacity to manufacture plants is possible, but it's going to take some effort. We also need to make sure that the regulatory processes uh, uh, are implemented and operate smoothly while still assuring that, that the regulations are strict in protecting public health and safety. Uh, and then we do have to work towards more advanced designs that can use fuel cycles, that can recycle spent fuel, and use uranium and thorium more efficiently. I think that those are the primary priorities. Okay, good. And then Greg Corrin, hey Greg, hi, is asking, um, are these new high temperature plant designs approved to be built in the U.S.? We've run similar ones already in the U.S. There was a plant called Fort St. Brain that General Atomics built uh, that was based on similar technology. It was helium cooled. There's helium-based test reactors running today. There's one in China at Tsinghua University, which is a pebble bed fueled reactor. There's another running in Japan today that uses uh, the fuel in a prismatic geometry. Um, the salt cooled reactors that we're interested in uh, have not been demonstrated using solid fuels. They've been uh, they've worked in the past as molten salt reactors at Oak Ridge, and so more development is needed in that area. And then there's the whole other side of fast-spectrum reactors uh, as well, that, that there's substantial development activity underway. And so there's a number of different technology options uh, for moving beyond the current light water reactor technology. And in, in you know, the spirit of having a diverse portfolio, investment portfolio, I think it's a good thing that we're pursuing several of them in parallel worldwide under the, the Generation 4 International Forum. Okay. Good. And then Kay is asking, what will, what will the nuclear industry's relationship be with fusion? Um, well, there's actually an interesting workshop that uh, was concluded just about two weeks ago uh, looking at the technical issues associated with fission-fusion hybrids because uh, fusion, fusion, it turns out, uh, can be an excellent source of, of additional neutrons. And in fission systems, the neutron economy is very tight. And so what I think people envision is the possibility that we'll actually see hybrid systems, fission and fusion coupled together, and then in the long term, longer term, the transition to uh, uh, pure fusion systems. Uh, that's a fairly long term effort because we're still basically on the fusion side in the basic science field of understanding plasma physics both for inertial confinement, where we're going to be uh, uh, doing a number of experiments at Lawrence Livermore National Lab and the National Ignition Facility in the near term, and then on the magnetic fusion side with the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, which is under construction now in southern France. So uh, it's a long-term direction, uh, and uh, in the near term, we'll, of course, m certainly be seeing mainly pure fission uh, systems. Okay, and, and Bradley is asking if you could say something about the, the construction operation, et cetera, about the French who use a lot more nuclear power than we do. Yeah, that's a really interesting story because the French during the first round of construction did their, did their construction much better than we did, mainly because they standardized their plant design. However, today 
um, the French are experiencing a lot of difficulties in building the first of their, their it's called the European Pressurized Reactor, in uh, uh, Finland. And I think that that can be attributed primarily to the fact that Areva, which is the French company uh, that's building the plant, has, has taken a much more evolutionary approach, uh, has not introduced the same level of technical innovation that Westinghouse has. And so the EPR is a very large plant. It's 1,600 megawatts, one of the largest ever built. Uh, and it has active safety systems, so it's a very large plant with all of that additional equipment. And it's proving to be challenging to build it. The AP1000 uses passive safety systems. It's a smaller plant, about 1,200 megawatts. Uh, and it, the construction is going very well because they're making use of these advanced construction technologies uh, that uh, Shaw, which owns 20% of Westinghouse, uh, is largely responsible for introducing into the design. And so I think that, that on the French side, they had very good early experience. But right now, actually, they're not as competitive as uh, the US designs are. Westinghouse, of course, Westinghouse is now owned 80% by Toshiba. Uh, but they're still doing a good job uh, in oh, any I case. I know that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. OK, now I'm sort of taking these questions in the order they come in. So they're going to jump around a little bit. And so the next one is from John. Um, and I think you left a word out of this, but let me try to guess. He says, how much cost or complexity does hydrogen production, I'm going to uh, add to a nuclear plant? Um, for hydrogen production, you could do just direct electrolysis, of course, and, and it wouldn't be a, a, a large change in the complexity. But uh, uh, low temperature electrolysis is not particularly efficient way to make hydrogen. So the main emphasis is on the uh, uh, development of high temperature reactors that can use either a process called high temperature electrolysis, which is a much more efficient way to uh, convert water into hydrogen and oxygen, or what are called thermochemical cycles uh, that would actually produce hydrogen through chemical reactions uh, in a closed loop, uh, typically using sulfuric acid as a, a uh, primary medium. And there's, there's research underway in the United States on both of those technologies in collaboration with French, Japanese, and other, other researchers internationally uh, to, to develop this capacity to produce hydrogen. People are very interested in the technology because we already use massive quantities of hydrogen in the United States. About 7% of all of our natural gas is converted into hydrogen. And it's used to, in the refinery industry to strip sulfur from uh, uh, crude oil and to take heavy materials and turn them into lighter liquids, uh, gasoline and such. Uh, and it's also used for production of fertilizers and a wide variety of different chemicals. So there's a huge market out there that you could feed hydrogen into. Uh, uh, once we develop the technology to produce it using uh, high temperature reactors. OK. And let me see. Justin is asking, could the compact HTR scale to a small city municipal utility of city sizes of about 70 to 100,000? Um, people are working on reactors that could do that. There's a strong emphasis out there now in developing new reactor designs that are smaller. Uh, there's a, a, a number of startup companies that are doing this. Uh, so uh, there's one called New Scale, which is developing some small modular light water reactors. Uh, BMW is doing the same thing. And then, of course, we have reactors like the PBMR. Uh, we, I think that we may see that, that the dominant use of the modular reactors is going to be in co-generating electricity and process steam or providing hydrogen to chemical facilities. Uh, but certainly, you can also see them being used for small grid applications, uh, including providing power to, to uh, uh, smaller cities and such. OK. OK, great. And then um, let me see. I asked that one. Bryce is asking, when could we expect to see the majority of uh, energy requirements being generated from nuclear? What point in the future? Well, that's a that's a tough question, right? Um, because uh, you know, it, it pro projecting out into the future. Let me just 
give you an idea of the scale of, of the problem. Uh, currently, uh, the world consumes about uh, 12 terawatts of power, primary energy. Uh, we expect by 2050 that the total demand for energy, given population growth and um, improved uh, uh, economies in the developing world and living standards, is going to grow to about 28 terawatts uh, by 2050. If you were to supply that 28 terawatts with nuclear power, you'd be talking about uh, the equivalent of about 10,000 large nuclear plants worldwide. It's quite conceivable that you'd be able to build them. Currently, we have about 400 plants operating. So you're talking about on the order of an expansion of a factor of 30 uh, from the, the, the current number. But there's a, a number of really serious challenges also that you would face in doing that. Uh, then you can go across and look at all of the other non-fossil energy sources plus carbon sequestration. Uh, and you see that, that many of the renewables actually are fundamentally constrained. Uh, in terms of getting any place close to, to 28 terawatts. For example, biomass, uh, you might be able to get up to about 2 terawatts on biomass uh, before you run into fundamental constraints on the amount of energy you can generate. So, in fact, there's, there's going to be really serious challenges in general in terms of providing adequate quantities of low carbon and clean energy uh, by 2050. And uh, the role that nuclear can play, certainly in theory we can get there, but there's a lot of effort that needs to be placed into developing better reactor designs and further reducing construction costs and making sure that the new designs meet increasingly stringent standards for security, uh, for safety, uh, and for waste minimization. Uh, so there, there's a lot of work. It's difficult to project precisely what will happen, uh, but the potential is that nuclear could be up at uh, 25 to 50 to 75 percent of primary energy by 2050 if the development goes uh, well. Wow. So from 400 to 10,000, that's a lot. That's, that's of course, you know, if the, the actual expansion rate is not that dissimilar from rates that were hit in France, if you think about it on a per GDP basis. Uh, it's, it's actually quite consistent with what France accomplished. You know, France, it's an interesting case because in a period of about 15 years, they went from uh, being less than 15% nuclear to being over 75% nuclear. Uh, they, in 1975, 45% of their electricity came from coal. Uh, in 2004, they closed their very last coal plant. Uh, and so the potential to expand nuclear, certainly in a technical sense, exists, uh, but uh, the logistics of actually accomplishing it on a global scale uh, would be uh, pretty challenging. So it'll take significant effort to get there. Okay. So Adam is asking, uh, he says he may have missed this, but I don't think you've addressed it yet. What's the state of recycling nuclear waste versus having to store it somewhere? Well, this is a very good question. Um, the, the first point is that today, uranium remains abundant. Uh, it's inexpensive, and the economics uh, greatly favor uh, fueling reactors with uh, uh, fresh uranium, uh, because the cost of recycling spent fuel with today's technology is, is pretty high. So there's not any current great pressure to move towards recycling. And furthermore, the technologies that are available that you could build today uh, are 30 to 40 years old. And it's not at all clear that we want to uh, uh, go down the route of deploying technologies that were state of the art three to four decades ago, as opposed to developing technologies that actually transition us towards fuel cycles that are more effective in consuming waste products and in using uranium efficiently. So. There's uh, significant efforts in R&D uh, to develop these new technologies. There's not a lot of time pressure to do it because of the fact that we can store waste safely uh, or we can store spent fuel safely today, uh, and there's plenty of uranium to f uh, fuel uh, new reactors that we might build out over the next 10 to the 15 years. So I think at this point what we do have is some fairly aggressive efforts worldwide to develop technologies that would be well-suited uh, for working with recycled uh, spent fuel. 
Uh, and we should see those technologies emerging to become a major fraction of commercial deployment within about 20 years or so, uh, would be my expectation. In parallel with that, we do have to develop uh, uh, some disposal capability. All fuel cycles generate materials uh, that require at least some of the materials uh, uh, permanent disposal. And so that means developing deep geologic repositories as well. The science behind doing that is well established. And in fact, in the United States, we're currently operating a deep geologic repository in southern New Mexico uh, in a deep bed of salt that's being used for the disposal of, of transuranic waste uh, from the, the US weapons program. Uh, currently, we're reevaluating our strategy uh, in terms of geologic disposal for spent fuel and high-level waste. And there will be a blue ribbon commission impaneled, uh, hopefully in the next uh, few months, uh, that will make recommendations on a comprehensive set of policies for how to manage spent fuel and high-level waste. So the science is there. Uh, the technology involves challenges. Uh, and there's also significant political challenges, uh, but there's nothing that fundamentally limits our capability to manage spent fuel safely, uh, to recycle uh, it, and to dispose of the residual byproducts in a safe way that protects public health and safety for a very long period of time. Okay. Well, you're talking about safety, but Adam is asking what about the environmental impact of recycling versus uh, storing. Right. And so there's, there's, of course, there's two sets of environmental impacts. Uh, one comes from the actual recycle process itself, because all, all chemical processes uh, will have some releases. And so when you recycle spent fuel, you'll, you'll have some releases of radioactive material into the environment. In general, when you look at the quantities that are released, uh, they're very small. And if you estimate public health impact, uh, you bring it down to the point where it's it's just an extremely small public health impact, uh, particularly when you compare it to what we currently accept with fossil fuels. You know, for example, uh, today in the United States, the best estimates are that particulate air pollution from combustion of fossil fuels uh, causes about 63,000 premature deaths each year in the U.S. from respiratory illnesses. Uh, when you look at the emissions from the both open and closed nuclear fuel cycles uh, and calculate the impact on public health and safety, the numbers are extremely small. So uh, I, I think that, that you, can, you can operate both open and closed uh, fuel cycles safely and protect the environment. And then deep geologic isolation uh, basically uh, it provides effective, can provide effective long-term isolation of materials as well, uh, where the potential long-term public health impacts can be made very small too. So these are problems which are certainly manageable and are so much easier to deal with than the environmental and public health problems that fossil fuels generate uh, that uh, uh, I, I think that, that we'll have the capability to, to, to manage these problems in an effective way. Well, it's great to hear nuclear energy discussed so intelligently. I have to say it's really, uh, I've learned a lot from this. But I have a question. Are you going to be on that Blue Ribbon Committee advising uh, on how to store and recycle nuclear energy? I have no idea. Uh, oh. the, 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 the names of the people who would be on that, that commission uh, are, are still sitting at the White House. And uh, I, I, I would not want to speculate. Uh, but... The one thing that I would uh, uh, feel uh, or would, would expect is that you'll have an impressive list of people uh, impaneled uh, to work on this problem. Okay. Uh, so it, it'll be interesting to see where we are in uh, a year and a half to two years when we have the recommendations. Okay. Well, that'll, that'll be something to look forward to. And then a couple quick questions. Uh, Don is asking, is France actually recycling as much as they claim? Uh, France recycles most of the spent fuel. As I mentioned, the issue, though, is that it's very expensive to fabricate that material into fuel that can be used in current reactors. And so they're not recycling all of it actually back into reactors. A fair amount of the separated plutonium uh, is being just placed into storage. Uh, advanced Gen 4 reactors have fuel forms that are much easier to fabricate and much less expensive to fabricate. And so that's 
that's the direction really that we probably need to go uh, in terms of, of closing the fuel cycle. Okay. Sounds like we can learn a lot from France. And then Kay is asking, when was the last nuclear plant power plant built? And worldwide, I would like to hear, and here in the U.S. Um, worldwide, uh, power plants have been built on a continuous basis uh, over the last couple of decades in Asia. There are uh, uh, 10 or 12 plants under construction right now in China. There's two in Taiwan. Uh, there's a couple in Japan. Uh, there's one in construction in Finland. Uh, the Russians have some under construction. We'll have new plants entering construction in the United States within, I think, two and a half years. Um, in the United States, the last plants to enter into construction, that was uh, quite some time ago, the last one to complete construction was in 1994. Okay. Well, I think that's about it. Uh, Justin is asking, will this uh, be made available as a recording? The answer is yes. We will have the recording available. We'll convert it to a movie and put it on our YouTube site, and we'll also have it available for viewing in WebEx, just as we are now, so that gives you the advantage of being able to see the uh, the chat room and et cetera. So, yes, it has been a terrific presentation. Thank you so much, Pear. Um, it's, it's been great. I, You're very talk. welcome. My pleasure. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And um, let me grab a copy of the chat file. If anyone wants a copy of the chat file, <clears throat> I don't think there are any URLs in there to revisit, but you can uh, just copy and paste it into a text file, or you can email me at webcast at O'Reilly.com, and I can send it to you. Everyone tells me I always close out the meeting before you can grab that, but, um, you know, just send me an email. And so I'm going to close out the meeting now, and just thank you once again. Great. Goodbye. Bye-bye.